Blessed be the beloved. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Open our hearts to the embrace of your Holy Spirit, that we may recognize your presence in ourselves, one another, and all of creation. For this we gather in your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the listening of God's word. A reading from Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out that you might be able to endure it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, 
you will all perish as they did. Are those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. Fig trees are much older than we are. Genesis recounts that Adam and Eve covered themselves in fig leaves when they figured out they were naked. A good choice, figs make large leaves. Figs were named as one of the foods in the promised land. Actually, the Bible mentions figs over 200 times because figs were original to Mesopotamia and Asia. And now they are cultivated across the world, including my front yard. We have two fig trees, which is how I learned that botanically a fig isn't technically a fruit. Figs are technically an inflorescence. I love that word. It's the complete flower head. So when you eat a fig, you're eating the stem and the stalk and the petals of flowers. Figs are a special structure called a siconium, which is maybe best described as a fleshy, ingrown stem. And because the stem is ungrown, the seeds and the flowers grow on the inside. The fig flowers within itself. This is why at the base of many fig varieties, if you take the fig itself, there's a hole in the bottom. It's called an osteole, and wasps crawl up inside it to indulge in nectar and fertilize the flowers, which means that when you eat a fig, you are technically eating a bouquet. There are early producing varieties of figs, Black Mission, for example, that come as early as May. Our figs are late season, August to September. They are beautiful, but they don't last very long. We call them garden to table because they will wither within days. In August, we eat lots of salads laced with figs. The parable of the fig tree that is given us this day is not one of the epic parables that we know by heart, that our tradition circles around. The man has come to his vineyard expecting fruit from his tree. There is nothing, and he says to the gardener, cut it down. The gardener thinks there's another way, another way to tend the tree, and he suggests feeding the soil. 
The gardener says, if it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. And the parable ends there, which isn't what we expect of our parables. At the wedding in Cana, the wine has run out, and Mary tells the host that her son can turn water to wine. The parable doesn't end there. We know how it ends. Jesus turns water to wine, and the guests believe they have saved the best wine for last in the prodigal son. We know that the prodigal has lived a wayward life, and he wants to return home. The story doesn't end there. The text tells us how the story ends. The father throws open his arms and welcomes his son home with a feast. But this parable that we had today does not tell us how the story ends. We are only told that if the owner of the vineyard agrees to let the tree live for another year, the tree might flourish and it might make fruit, but we don't know. What this says is that how the, the story ends in this parable isn't the point. Our focus isn't meant to be on if the vineyard owner will give, will get his fruit or not get his fruit, or if the tree will be cut down or flourish. The point of the parable is how the boss responds, the gardener responds when his boss says, cut it down. There are a number of ways that people read the Bible. Some people approach it as a document of history written in certain times and in certain places and under certain circumstances, the various collection of books that make up the Bible can tell us about the way the world was at a given moment in time. It's one way to read it. Another way to read the Bible is for spiritual wisdom. These texts were inspired by a human connection to the divine, so we go to these inspired texts seeking inspiration, seeking wisdom. We do both in the Episcopal Church. We understand these texts were written in a different time, in a different culture, under different circumstances, and that's important to the way we understand the text. And we hold that there is something larger than history in these texts. Then and now, that is about the wisdom of the text. Some faith communities take the biblical text literally. At least some parts of it they take literally. In the Episcopal Church, we read... <laughs> in the Episcopal Church, we read these texts metaphorically because we are apt to miss a much larger and much more expansive meaning if we only take the text literally. I was talking about this with some folks recently in our belonging class. It's helpful, I think, this teaching from Buddhism to illustrate the point. The Buddha is pointing to the moon, and he looks around at his students, and they are all staring at his finger. It's not what is pointing that's the point. It's the moon. This is what I say generally about the Bible in the Episcopal Church, this sense that the higher way to interact with Scripture is to let the Scripture point us beyond itself. But this text that we have today, Two Men and a Fig Tree, is ba based in our culture in this moment does something different with us because I think it wants us to read it metaphorically and literally. If we read this parable metaphorically, spiritually, we might come up with something like, though a tree or a person is not producing or flourishing in the world, still there is hope. Still, there is fertilizer. If there is care, there's hope. It's a great way to understand that text. 
The danger about metaphoric texts and readings, though, is that it builds up a concept in our head. This concept is good, that if we have enough confidence in things, if we work with something that's not flourishing, it will flourish. So we get this idea in our head. The problem with us, though, is that we get good concepts and it ends right there. We think we've done it because we've got it, right? The concept is good. There's latent potential in everything. So feed the tree, feed the soil. This is a good sermon stance, but the danger of it is that it is only a concept and it stays in our head. So whatever wisdom means, it really doesn't mean all that much if it just stays up there. Like in our gospel, it can just be an idea. Our gospel leaves us with the idea that something could happen. But nothing happens with just an idea. So at the end of the parable, there's no manure around the tree. The gardener has an idea of what to do, but at the end of the parable, nothing has been done. The tree is still not flourishing. We are meant to understand this text metaphorically, but we are also meant to act on this text literally. The wisdom of the universe is not meant to be in our head. It is meant to be embodied and lived in the world. The Buddha is pointing to the moon and every moonbeam is pointing back at us. Moses comes to the burning bush, God making God's self known, I am. It is pure presence and pure being. And God says, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. The first thing God asks of Moses is not to bow down. It is not to slaughter some poor animal. It is to recognize the holiness of the ground, to take his shoes off, nothing separating the man from the ground he was standing upon. I used to think in the concept in my head that that ground was special ground because it was near a burning bush, the burning bush. But I don't believe for a minute anymore that God meant for Moses to understand that the only ground that was holy was the ground around that burning bush. It's all holy ground. The burning bush, the God inside the burning bush, the fire God wanted Moses to hear and us to hear. Literally, our ground is holy. Putin, in the name of Russia, bombed a theater last week that was sheltering Ukrainian children. People painted the word children in bold white letters in Russian on the sides of the building and the ground. And this morning, a school sheltering hundreds of civilians was bombed. There are evacuees from Afghanistan in our town that are grief-stricken for what is happening to their country and to their families still there. There is work. Lots of work happening to help get them food and housing and English classes and jobs. And so many people have been helpful. And please continue to be helpful because this is a long road for them. 
But while we're doing all this to be helpful, their families are struggling in Afghanistan. So for some weeks, every time I would see the family, they would say through this Google Translate piece. So the way Google Translate works is I speak into a telephone and say, how are you? And then and they can read it in Farsi or Dari. And then they speak Dari back and it says, I'm doing just fine today, how are you? And they say it while they pat their hand on their heart. So this day I'm there and I say, hello, how are you? And say, it comes back to me, can you help our family? And I say, you mean your family in Afghanistan? Yes. And I say, I don't know how to help them. And so this happens a few times. And then I'm there one day, and I say, how are you? And it comes back, can you help our family? And I say, you know, you've asked me before. I, I don't know how to do that. And the boy texts back, they need bread. And so I, we, are, we have a group that talks about how, do we, how are we doing, what, what needs to happen for this family. And um, it's decided that the way to help the family settle here is to help the family eat there. We can't ask them to settle here if their family can't eat there. And so we found a way to send $500 to Afghanistan. And that $500 will feed an extended family of 30 people for three months. I am shocked at how little it takes to do something and how long it took for us to come around to doing it. And I am the mother of four children. And when a towel's on the floor or a dish is on the table, I do this. You have been given opposable thumbs. <laughs> Use them. The gardener offered an emancipated way of seeing the fig tree's potential, the possibility in it. But the only opportunity for the emancipation to happen is for us to practice it. The gospel story doesn't tell us how the story ends because in this gospel story, we have become the story. We make the ending. By the way we live, the world will flourish or not. So the fig, wherever you grow them or acquire them, is meant to be nourishment. And I can think of nothing more beautiful to eat than a bouquet of flowers. Nothing more gorgeous in concept or reality than figs. Often, we end with a poem, but today I'm going to end with a recipe. So, you take a small loaf of crusty bread that's unsliced, like a moundy kind of bread, and one log of mozzarella that's unsliced, and two handfuls of fresh figs, and you quarter them, and really good olive oil, and fresh cracked pepper, and salt. Those are your ingredients. And you tear up the bread into bites. And you tear up the cheese, and you toss it together with the figs. 
and you dress it in the olive oil and you add salt and you add pepper to taste and you eat it with your hands and you share it with your friends and you enjoy it and you are grateful. Amen. The prayers of the people today may be found in your bulletin. We arise today by splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depth of the sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock. We pray for all nations and leaders of the world. We arise today through God's strength to pilot us, by God's eye to look before us, and God's wisdom to guide us. We pray for the welfare of the world. We arise today by God's way that lies before us, God's shield to protect us. We pray for our community. We arise from all who may wish us will, afar and anear, alone and in a multitude, against every cruel, merciless power that may oppose the body and soul. We pray for all who suffer and are in any trouble. We arise as Christ is with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ inside us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us, Christ on our right, Christ on our left, Christ when we lie down, Christ when we sit down, Christ when we arise, Christ to shield us. We pray for all who have died. We arise for Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of us. We pray especially today for Anne Marie, Barbara, Betty, Bill, Carl, Case, Char, Clinton Megan, Baby DeWitt, Courtney, Dave, Dean Emerson Hall and family, Deborah, Emily, Eric, Erica, Hazel, Jessica, John, John and Jan, Judy, Mary, Danny and Ronnie, Maxella, Megan and Adam, Melanie, Mike and family, Nina LaFarber, Paul, Terry, the Lehman family and Noah who has died, and all those impacted by Russia's war on Ukraine. This week, we celebrate the birthdays of Ray Botham, Richard Smith, Abby Reitzel, Linda Allison, and Paxton Rains. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Joseph's Chapel and students, staff and faculty of Christ School. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for La, Gil La Iglesia Anglicana de Mexico. With these, our prayers, we arise today. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. 
We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us. For our Savior, Jesus Christ, we may bow in your love and serve in your will. Amen. God of grace, who desires that all death lead to life, work in these lives so that all that is broken in us would be healed, all that is unforgiven would be released, and all that is unlived blossom into a future of love. Through the cross of Christ, God have mercy upon you, pardon you, and set you free. God strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Morning. So you've noticed that following communion, there's somebody chasing you down with their thumb. We are offering anointing following um, following communion after you receive the sacrament, and I just want to name why we're doing that. Um, anointing is actually the oldest sacrament in the church. Uh, it predates our Christian sacraments. Um, And it is a way that we recognize what is present. It's a mark of recognition. Um, So we mark, you are marked as Christ's own in baptism. We mark the Christ in you. And our hope, the hope of the church, the hope of the sacrament, is that as you are marked as Christ, you recognize Christ within you, It triggers in us recognition of Christ beyond us, Christ in all the world. So we'll say, Christ in you, Christ in the world, Christ in you, Christ in all. That's the event. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
All things come of thee, O Lord. Now thine own. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give God thanks and praise. God of all love, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory glory to you. Through your blessing, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the caretakers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return through prophets and sages. You revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, he us. By his wounds, we are and therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory and their unending hymn. And so, dear God, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our mothers and fathers, God of Sarah and Abraham, Rebecca and Isaac, and Leah and Rachel and Jacob, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only, and not for strength, for pardon only, and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, 
that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be at peace. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended, not with time as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. Amen. few announcements. One is I want to welcome Mike with us today conducting that was beautiful choir and you. So grateful. Also want to be sure everyone's aware that Steve Warner is directing the choir for us in this interim period. Beautiful work. Thank you for being with us. We have Wayne Smith. I just love getting to know him a bit. He's here practicing often, and it's a treat to have the organ flooding the building. Thank you, and welcome, and we're grateful. And we had Penny on flute. 
Big heart love. Um, it's our week to drive our Afghan neighbors where they need to be. Good news, though. Found. Nor uh, driver's license study guide in Dari. <laughs> Yes, in Virginia and in California. So I'm figuring there's enough in common. We're just gonna go with that. So, but in the meantime, we continue to drive every other week. Bill Haskamp will be in the Narthex and is happy to help you figure out a way to be helpful with driving. And I promise you it will um, be a delight to you to have an encounter with our Afghan family. Um, belonging class today, I'm talking about church history. We're gonna start at the way, way, way beginning and come all the way to today and in one hour. So come, it'll be great. Um, and we will be mask optional in here as of Palm Sunday. So you are so welcome to keep your mask on as long, no, a lot of people I know will and have already told me they will and that is so welcome. And also at that point, unless something shifts with the other one that's out there. We're going to go to mask optional on Palm Sunday. That's what I got. So let's go forth to love and to serve. Thanks be to God.